Well, good morning. How's everybody doing so far? <laughs> I'm amazed. I mean, I have a sense that this is a very significant gathering and event that's happening here. We'll look back in five years and say, wow, it all started then. And um, I really want to thank Brian and Matthew um, for organizing this and for having us come here. I'm sincerely honored and you know, profoundly grateful. So thank you all, and to Rebecca and Yosef as well, who have been great to deal with. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Nina, whom everybody knows. She's the co-founder of Bioneers, and uh, Joshua is over here, our executive director. So um, I, I guess most of the day is going to be about agriculture, so that was what I was mainly going to focus on. And Yosef had asked if I would just frame the bigger issues just a little bit, but I have very limited time, so I'm just going to keep that super short, which is um, <clears throat> all, here, so here's the short version. Basically, as a species, we've been acting like a rock star, trashing a hotel room, and it's the morning after, only this hotel is planet Earth, the guest rules are non-negotiable, and if we don't change our ways of living really fast, we're going to get voted off the island. So that's basically what we need to understand. Um, you know, the science is pretty well in on a lot of stuff. Two-thirds of the planet's ecosystems are in serious and accelerating decline. We're entering into uncharted territory. For those of you who want to look at some of the, I think, the more um, cutting-edge science right now, the Stockholm Resilience Center has done work on the nine planetary boundaries, of which we've already crossed four. Um, the reality, however, on the ground here is that climate disruption is coming on bigger, faster than even the alarmists predicted. Um, it's being called now the Anthropocene era. The, you know, b we, human beings have essentially become a force of nature. Um, this is completely unprecedented. Uh, we, there are no ground rules from here on out. And what we know is we've set the big wheels in motion and we truly don't know what's going to happen now other than we, there is going to be a very unfortunate degree of suffering that was totally preventable. Um, so, you know, we need to do everything we can as quickly as we can and as, you know, very intelligent and hopefully judicious choices that we'll make. Um, we'll get into it a little bit later, but from the perspective of Bioneers, the solutions are largely present. I mean, we basically have a very good idea what to do right now or certainly what directions to head in. Um, what I'm witnessing is that we're in the thick of a revolution right now, having watched the arc of this um, solutions-based culture over the last 25 years, it's reaching a critical mass. It's actually much bigger than people realize right now and infiltrating society at all levels very, very quickly. So, you know, the game is far from over. Um, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, I think the coming years are going to make the 60s look like the 50s. And that's here present in this room. It is a revolution. It's a revolution from the heart of nature and from the human heart. And um, we have four billion years of R&D from nature to learn from. So, um, you know, we've got a whole lot going for us at the same time. I did want to say just one other note about the nine planetary boundaries is that they're all, um, th there's a 10th planetary boundary, which is justice. And the climate extremes that we're witnessing today correlate precisely with the extremes of wealth, which are unprecedented, the concentration of wealth and power in the world. Um, that is not an accident. <laughs> um, as our friends and, you know, um, elders at, in Iroquois Six Nations in the U.S., tell us um, we will have peace with Mother Earth only when we have justice, and justice is a process that never ends. There will always be issues to address. So we need to get really good at making peace <laughs> and acknowledging justice and dealing with it you know, at all times. Um, so I just wanted to preface it. So why am I talking to you about agriculture? I grew up in New York City. My father taught at Columbia. My parents didn't even have a house plant, you know, literally. My mother has a black thumb, basically. <laughs> any, any plant she touches will die just as soon as it sees her coming. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually. Um, so I was making a film in 1984 um, called Hoxie, How Healing Becomes a Crime. And it's about uh, medical politics and particularly the suppression and obstruction of unconventional um, cancer treatments. And the, the film is based around one case history, a classic case history of this um, a fellow named Harry Hoxie, who inherited his family's herbal treatment for cancer, which was actually discovered by his great grandfather's horse, reputedly. And so I fell very deeply into the world of botanical medicine and um, started to research you know, everything I could learn about this particular um, plant medicine formula. And in the course of my you know, meanderings, I, I met Christopher Bird, who was the co-author of the book, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, 
which was very controversial, very interesting book at that time. <clears throat> and um, I thought what I was doing provocative, you know, was provocative herbal cancer treatment. Chris was talking about plants having sentience and consciousness and communicating with each other and all that good stuff. So anyway, he called me up a few months later and asked if I would make a film about a friend of his on an Indian Pueblo just north of Santa Fe where I, where I live. And so it sounded kind of interesting. It was a paying gig, so I, I went. And, um, and it turned out um, Gabriel was a master organic farmer um, who had studied with Alan Chadwick in California, who helped bring biodynamic agriculture to the, to the States. And Chadwick told his students, if you really, really want to learn about farming, go study with native peoples. These are the people who have been doing it for millennia and have a very profound relationship with, with growing. Um, so Gabriel started in Mexico and wandered down through Central America, ended up in Latin America. And um, as, as native people, um, you know, he began to learn what's called TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, a different kind of tech. <laughs> um, and as people came to trust him, which is not a small thing, you know, that he, that he had the integrity and the intention, um, they began to share with him what for them is the most precious of gifts, which is the gift of seeds because through the seeds speak the voices of the ancestors. And each time that you plant a seed, you become an ancestor for the generations to come. So it's a profoundly sacred transmission. And he had gathered this extraordinary arc of traditional, um, you know, mostly food plants and herbs, medicinal plants, um, heirlooms and traditional indigenous um, seeds and stuck them in the ground at San Juan Pueblo, just north of, of Santa Fe. So um, that's what I was up there to film, it turned out. And he gave me this tour of this astonishing arc that he had created. Um, hundreds, literally hundreds of varieties of corn, including teosinte, which is this stubby little thing that you would barely even recognize as being corn. It's, it's the mother of all corns, right, from southern Mexico. It's where it all came from, through the ingenuity of human plant breeding, non-genetic engineering, you know. Um, and you know, also just hundreds of varieties of tomatoes, every size, shape, color you could beyond what you could imagine. I lived on a small farm for about six years, but this was beyond anything that I had ever seen or imagined. It was really my introduction to biodiversity and biodiversity in the garden. And um, so, as I filmed with Gabriel, he also brought up the fact that these seed stocks were disappearing very, very rapidly. You know, genetic erosion, um, the loss of, of the gene pool is actually the single greatest threat to agriculture on the planet. We built this industrial system that that's, um, grows profits, not food. That, that's really what it's there for. Um, and essentially um, have engineered seeds, well, throttled seed diversity, brought it down to monocultures. Um, engineered those monocultures to grow with very heavy recipes of chemicals, to highly toxic chemicals. The basis of all of it is patents. That's really what it is about, is proprietary control. And it was creating this catastrophic situation um, on which, you know, world food supply depends. Not a good idea. Um, so it became very clear to me in that moment how incredibly important it was. And I thought I was there to make a movie. You know, it turned out I was there to start a seed company, <laughs> which Gabriel and I launched in a couple years later in 1989, a company called Seeds of Change. Um, it was the first national organic seed company. You know, seeds are the first link in a safe food web. But even today, right now, uh, seeds are not, for the most part, are not organic. Um, so that in itself is a, don't get me started, that's a whole other discussion we can get into. But, um, uh, and then really the, the idea was that, you know, um, the people who care about biodiversity are gardeners for the most part. And we set it up as a commercial enterprise, as a, as a market partnership with backyard gardeners. You know, everybody's always leaning over the fence, hey, what's that tomato you got and how can I get some and can I trade you this? And, you know, that's really where the action was. And, um, it was, it, and that's, I won't get into the whole story of Seeds of Change, but that was kind of where, you know, my, my entry point into agriculture. And then, um, you know, many of us uh, in the early, by the early 70s were highly aware of the collision course that society was on with nature and that we really had to do something. You know, it was no secret. And so I didn't want to sit there kind of quivering in the dark, you know, being depressed and fearful. So I just set out on a personal quest as a journalist and just a, a citizen, actually, to find out who was out there who might have real solutions to our major environmental crises. And one by one by one, kind of during the 70s and 80s, I came across all these different people 
who had really major fundamental solutions to you know, huge global crises. And the pattern that I started to observe was first of all, they were all systems thinkers. You know, they took a solve the whole problem approach. Everything is connected. You know, as John Muir once so beautifully said, in nature, everything is hitched to everything else. Well, the same is true as of our society. You know, as human beings, we are nature. We didn't invent nature, nature invented us. We'd be wise to learn the ground rules and how to play by them. And so, um, and then the second principle really or pattern that connected all these people was that they had looked to nature not as a physical resource, um, but as a model, a mentor, and a metric. You know, the basic disarmingly simple question being, how would nature do it? And, you know, boy, you can spend many lifetimes trying to understand that. And that's what I'm so beautifully hearing people talk about here this morning. So um, I was, uh, in 1990, Nina and I started uh, what became Bioneers. Um, the idea was to bring together the, you know, the real social and scientific innovators um, to talk with each other and just like what's happening here this morning to begin to provide a platform to get these, this remarkable work out into the world. And the entry point for a lot of it, because of the association with Seeds of Change, was around food systems. And by the way, it was the biggest entry point into Bioneers at that time. It still is today, 25 years later. Food systems is often the entry point for people to develop environmental awareness. So it should not be underestimated at that level what a profound educational tool it is. Um, and so we very quickly began, the, you know, the Seeds of Change crew, all these seed heads, as we called ourselves at the time, were um, just the Olympics of gardening. I mean, these guys were absolute maniacs and, you know, deep, deep into esoteric farming methods of all sorts. So we began to provide a platform for permaculture, for biodynamics, for John Jevons, for Wes Jackson, and, you know, uh, perennial uh, pra prairie polyculture, and on and on and on, and really try to bring the major schools of alternative agriculture together and to provide you know, a platform to, to get the word out about all of that. So we've had the tremendous privilege of being able to learn from all of these people and also to cross-pollinate these many important you know, schools of knowledge because no one, there is no one magic bullet or one solution. It's a suite of solutions and it's, um, there's so much knowledge yet to be gained. We're very humble in what we don't know. You know that's what keeps us up at night. So just to give you a few examples, a few stories of some of the kinds of things, but um, Nina mentioned to a, a smaller group yesterday about our friend Paul Stamets. Um, Paul's a mycologist up in the Pacific Northwest in the US um, who you know, studied a lot about the medicinal properties of herbs. And as an ecologist, he began to wonder, well, what is the, the medicinal function, you know, the, the healing function that, that mycelia play in the landscape? So he got a chance to test that when there was a very large diesel fuel spill near his little farm. Um, and they, the state of Washington invited a bunch of people, companies to come in and kind of road, you know, take a crack at this contaminated soil. They set up these cells of dirt, um, about 20 feet by 20 feet, I think. You know, they stank horribly, putrid from, you know, hydrocarbons, and it was just pretty much dead dirt at that point when it happened. So um, Paul decided to have at it along with all these other companies, and he inoculated the spore of oyster mushrooms into his cell of dirt. And they all covered it up, and I think it was about six or eight weeks later they came back, and one by one by one they ripped the tarps off these things, and still the stench of hydrocarbons. I mean, if the other treatments were working at all, it was very very slow. They were using enzymes, the usual heat beaten treat. You know, kind of if brute force doesn't work, you haven't used enough. You know, that was basically the mentality. And then they get to Paul's little cell of dirt, rip the tarp off, and it's completely blanketed with oyster mushrooms, some of them a foot foot and a half in diameter. They tested the soil. There was absolutely no residue of diesel. They tested the flesh of the mushrooms, nothing there. So this is not change, this was transformation. Something the mycelia knew, to had, you know, in nature there is no waste. Everything is somebody's lunch of either food or energy. <laughs> it's very simple. The mushrooms treated the oil as food. The reason that I bring this up is it has profound implications for agriculture because um, most of our fertilizers are oil-based, as are herbicides and pesticides. When, if we talk about large-scale transition to organic farming, we're dealing with highly contaminated soil all over the planet. It can take a very long, long time to, to, you know, to detoxify that. The official length of time is three years to transition to organic. But even if you've done that, the soil realistically is still going to be contaminated. 
um, mushrooms and mycelia could fast forward that entire process. It takes months, not years, and you can actually completely bioremediate the soil at the same time that you're building the soil health. So this is, and you don't need an engineer, you need a gardener to do this stuff. This is guerrilla stuff. I mean, I think many of us become frustrated by bureaucracy, by government, by regulation, all of this kind of stuff. This is stuff that can be done by guerrilla gardeners worldwide over the planet, you know, all around the planet. Effectively, it's citizen science in action. You know, this is one of the things I think that we should move on quickly to, to actually just enable people to do this on much, much larger scales. Um, right, let's see. So um, another thing that's a, a really important point is um, you may have seen the new Rodale. Oh, by the way, let me just finish that story with one little thing, which is that Paul, who's basically an old hippie, got contacted by the Pentagon because forget Saddam Hussein, the U.S., you know, the, the late Saddam Hussein, the U.S. has by far the biggest stockpiles in the world of chemical and biological weapons. And there's no good way to get rid of them. They wanted to incinerate them in Arkansas and other places. And of course, the you know, people did not want that. It just goes into the air and you know, spreads. Um, so they asked him if he had any mushrooms that might have an effect on this. So you know, he's a pretty serious scientist. And he took 28 samples that he gave them blind samples, one through 28, didn't tell them what they were, sent it off to the Pentagon. This is for sarin uh, nerve gas which is right up there with plutonium, right? Human-made, super deadly, and indestructible, basically. So he kind of forgot about it. They gave him security clearance, all this stuff. Six, eight months later, he got a call back. Sure enough, two of the mushrooms had worked. They completely metabolized the sarin. No trace left whatsoever. One of them is the turkey tail mushroom, which Paul also used on his mother for breast cancer, stage four breast cancer successfully. It's now going through trials at the NIH. Um, and the other one, which he doesn't often say publicly, which was the super performer, was psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, which were the super performer for detoxifying, you know, um, sarin VX. So go, you know, draw your own conclusions, but <laughs> they don't call them magic mushrooms for nothing. <laughs> um, so the Rodale study that has come out recently, they've been doing very careful trials for about the last decade. Agriculture is basically responsible now for about 30% of, of GHGs, of global greenhouse gases, right? Um, this is, it's the single most destructive human activity against the environment is farming. It's death by farming. I mean, we, have, we have done this so badly, it's almost, you know, it'd be hard to do it worse in a lot of ways. So what do we do with that? Um, well, ironically, agriculture is a huge part of the solution. Basically, the Rodale research is showing that a large-scale shift to or what they call regenerative organic agriculture, which is an important distinction, um, could suck up more than 100% of the greenhouse gases that are out there right now. So this really needs to be put at the top of the list, uh, again, on a very large scale. In many cases, you don't need government. This is actually, in some ways, more about engaging the business sector um, than, than government in that regard. But I think this is an area where going to scale makes tremendous sense to do it, and without going into some of the biology behind it, but I don't think there's much question that this is largely true. And if we wanted to stay below the 1.5 centigrade level, you know, two degrees is actually too high. We've got to stay even under that from what we understand. You know, who knows what's going to happen here. But um, if we transitioned about 55% of our farmlands by 2020, that would, t I, that would take it down. It would take it down by, um, if we did half of that, we would take it down by 55%, which would keep us below 1.5 centigrade. So this is really, really big stuff that we're, you know, looking at here. Um, and this works at, at all scales in the tropics and the temperate zones, you know, and so forth. Um, when we talk about bringing things to scale, it can be confusing because it doesn't always mean getting bigger. Um, in many cases, especially if we're talking about resilience, it means multiplying, spreading these things at smaller scales, you know, like distributed energy is a very good analogy for that. You don't want one giant centralized solar power plant in Navajo Nation that provides all the electricity for the whole U.S. You want di distributed energy all over the country. The same is true of farming. The issue there right now is that what we are growing is really not what we need. When you go to the farmer's market, for instance, it's pretty much fruits and vegetables and artisanal pro um, products. That's not what we actually eat. 
Uh, Michael Abelman has talked a lot about this. We need grains, we need legumes. This is what really needs to be scaled up at the mid-range level. Um, what we also, uh, we did a whole project in New Mexico that I'll mention just briefly uh, called Dreaming New Mexico uh, to look at local food sheds and what's really needed. But there's what's called farming in the middle, which is farms that are about 1,000 acres to 3,000 acres. Those are often the ones most under threat. Those are the ones we actually most need right now. That is scalable to spread that and to conserve whatever we do have right now to not let those farms go down or that farmland to be lost. Um, so that's something we really need to be looking at in a much more analytical way is what should we be growing and that mid-range scale is actually, that's, those are large farms. If you've ever been on a farm, uh, 1,000 to 3,000 acres is a lot. So um, I wouldn't underestimate it. At the same time, small and medium-sized family farms are absolutely not going to feed the world. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. So I think we need to be extremely reality-based here, and we're dealing with, you know, beyond urgency. We're in emergency from here on out, pretty much. So we need to act very quickly on some of these things. So there's a really important book called World Agriculture um, by Jason Clay at WWF. This is, I don't know, about 10 years ago that Jason did this. We first had Bioneers, at, uh, Jason at Bioneers, I think in 91 or 92, it, it, genius grade, I mean, his work that he does. But anyway, what they did is they looked at the 15 major global agricultural commodities to understand whether we could transition production at that scale um, you know, of, of agricultural commodities um, and but with green practices. And what they found is absolutely it's doable. The book gives case history after case history of how it can actually be done. Shrimp, rice, you know, cotton, wheat, all of it. Um, and the most interesting takeaway from the whole thing was the most successful models um, were ones where workers had a stake in it. Duh, you know. I'd like to form one more nonprofit before I die called the Duh Institute, you know. <laughs> We'd have plenty of work, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but, but that work, it's, it's already been proven out. You know, again, it needs to be, we need to understand what are the triggers that are going to now make that into an actual reality and, and make it happen. But we cannot ex ignore large-scale commodity production. And as I say, the world is simply not going to be fed by, by small family farms. Um, and most of you here are probably are pretty familiar with holistic rangeland management, as it's now called. But um, you know the meat industry clearly is a huge problem in the way that it's done now. We definitely eat too much meat, um, and at the same time, meat production is not going to go away. I know that uh, Christiana is going to be talking about this later. Nor should it necessarily go away. And back to kind of Bioneer's world and biomimicry, the idea of um, imitating nature. Essentially, what holistic rangeland management does, and I'm sure other people here are far more knowledgeable about the practicalities than I am, but um, it mimics the original patterns in the US of migratory herds of ungulates, mainly the buffalo in the United States. And the key hallmark is what's now called in management, move them and mob them. The real problem is keeping the animals in one place for too long. And as a result, the grass cycle never gets to complete. So the animals graze it down to the nub, and it's simply unable to regrow. It causes soil erosion, you know, many, many, many problems, what huge water problems because the animals are stuck in one place. So basically, instead of having coyotes and wolves to chase the, you know, the herds of ungulates, what they use are electric fences, mobile electric fences, which get moved, and the cycle of the grasslands, um, you know, is able to regenerate appropriately. And what they find, which is what, you know, when the, when the Europeans first came to North America, in the Great Plains, the grass was chest high, literally, and there were huge herds of buffalo. So um, what it turns out is the buffalo co-created that ecosystem. They created the grasslands, which brought the rain, which, you know, and fertilized the soil. And, you know, it's a complete food web and, and a hub, but the animals actually co-created that. So that's being done very successfully in a number of places around the world now, you can do large scale meat production in that kind of a setting while you're also actually regenerating the ecosystem at the same time. Uh, the question of how much meat we should eat and all the other health considerations, that's a whole other discussion, but in practical terms, this is a really significant um, thing. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to mention one other, th a couple, two other things, but um, we did a project called Dreaming New Mexico. Um, and my partner tragically died of cancer, you know, about six, seven years into the project, Peter Warshall, whom I honor in this moment, who was 
a polymath and a, I mean blindingly brilliant, incredible mind. But um, so the idea was very simple, which is that dreaming the future can create the future. And most of us as people seeking change and as activists end up in a position of resistance most of the time of just trying to stop all the bad stuff from happening. And it's an endless struggle. I mean, it's always coming at you, right? And it's, you gotta resist. But what happens is we don't step back and ask what it is that we really, really want. You know, what, what is actually our dream? If, if we, what does success look like, right? You know, if we really got what we want instead of settling for what we think we can get, what would the world look like? So that was the premise we started with. <clears throat> and no one had ever done this that we were aware of anyway at a state level of trying to take a systems view of what that would be for, so the year is 2020, we've done everything right. What does the age of local food sheds look like, right? What would that actually be? And so I'm sorry the materials didn't arrive, but we can make sure that they do and it is all online. But um, we created future maps and we created actually a shadow think tank as we called it of the you know, top people we could find across a very diverse spectrum of both areas of activity as well as perspectives um, and kind of worked with them to develop, co-develop all these different dreams. Um, and then we started a mapping process, a literal mapping. And when you look at a state like New Mexico, it's really just lines on a map that have nothing to do with the reality on the ground, right, with the actual ecology. So what we discovered very quickly, if you're talking about local food sheds, and this was Peter Warshaw's first innovation, was these are actually agro-eco regions. New Mexico has six different agro-eco regions. They're quite distinct. They're defined by their watershed, first and foremost, and then, of course, by climate and, and microclimate. Um, they're also defined by what we call culture sheds, which people often don't look at, but you know th that's a significant... Um, part of it. Um, so I think that in looking at this kind of mapping, it's tremendously important to start, you know, from the, both the ecology, but then also to integrate the culture. And, you know, oftentimes people in the local food movement get a bit carried away, which I understand. I appreciate the passion. But, you know, we've got to be 100% local, right? Well, great. Would you like to give up coffee yeah. or chocolate or mangoes or, you know, where do you want to start? So, um, so that's just not going to happen. So that was one of the things that we tried to really confront in a, in a meaningful way of, well, how do you deal with that, with the fact that, in fact, what you're doing is going to be limited um, in, in that regard. And the conclusion that we came to, which we actually put to the governor, uh, was that New Mexico should become the first fair trade state that we are gonna find sister communities with kindred values and practices, um, and we're gonna trade for the things that we want. Because if we went 100% local in New Mexico, which we couldn't do anyway, we'd be putting out of business hundreds of small farmers in Mexico, subsistence organic farmers. Is that the intention? Of course not, you know? So why don't we instead trade with them? Um, so that was a really, really important thing. Um, another thing you probably are familiar with local economies, it's called the LOIS model. Uh, L-O-I-S, local ownership, import substitution, right? Those are really the two primary cornerstones of what you're looking for. So what, more widely distributed local ownership, but the import substitution, okay, very interesting question. So we went, you know, there's, um, we have a pamphlet with the, with the age of local food sheds that you'll see just is incredibly rich with data. Um, and what we found was the data did not exist for a lot of things that we were trying to find. So the state of New Mexico, like most places, the only thing that they track is exports, right? Because that's cash in the bank. That's how the, the mentality of that economy. So what do we import in the way of food that we could substitute for? So we had to actually construct that data as best we could. Um, and just to give you one small example that blew our minds, but okay, suppose you wanted to have all organic dairy in New Mexico, cheese and, um, uh, cheese and milk and you know and so forth. Um, it turned out it would take one medium-sized organic dairy to supply the entire state. I mean that was it. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. Same with chickens. It would take a couple of farms. You know, so the stuff once you dial in on the granular, it's um, it's a whole. It's much more doable than anybody really thinks. So I know my time is almost out. I just wanted to um, close with uh, two short, very short stories. 
So Peter Warshall did a lot of consulting in the 90s for major food companies and you know, everybody, sustainability was kind of the first wave of corporate sustainability you know, consciousness at that time. So he had spent about a day and a half with Paul Hawken with a giant food company. I forgot, I think, I can't remember who it was, maybe, anyway. But um, so they went through sustainability 101 and not deprive future generations of what we have now and leave the world a better place and blah, blah. So finally they asked, okay, anybody got an, can you tell me one product in your company, you know, that you would consider to be sustainable? It was kind of a long pause. Finally, a guy raises his hand, he says, well, we have this breakfast cereal, and it has a shelf life of six months. <laughs> so we got a lot of education to do still. <laughs> you know. And then my theory of social change is that um, so th because of plantation agriculture, we're good, cacao, you know, the basis of chocolate, is under tremendous threat. And within probably less than 10 years, we're going to see a worldwide chocolate shortage. So my theory of change is I believe that at that moment, the women of the world are going to rise up and take over and do it right. So. So. May it be so. <laughs> so I think I'm out of time. Is there Q&A at all or we need to keep moving? Or? Really enjoyed the stats and the nuances and the key themes and ideas that you raised there. Um, we are quite short on time, but I know people will be really eager to ask questions. So we thought we'd allow time for two questions. So first two hands up, get the prize. You're a winner. Hi. Wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell me the, how far is the reach of Monsanto? Uh, I, I have started a library garden and I've been working it for the last six years. You know, and I get seeds from different companies. I mean, I'm going to look, look your company up if it's... <laughs> um, do you know the reach of Monsanto? I've been told by workers that I've called certain seed companies. And they say they get their seeds from Monsanto. Um, various, you know, vet, we grow various vegetables. Well, actually, it's you know it's it's more political and economic reach that they have in a lot of ways. But um, you know they're informally called Monsatan. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're truly a bad actor. And you know, I, I people you know I'm I'm for the death penalty for corporations. Um, they they are given a legal charter. They're they're a legal fiction. They exist only on paper. They're not a person. I mean, we all know this. So. I think that um, we're reaching the point where there may be an international criminal court that actually you know, goes after this. Um, but Monsanto, the destructive um, capacity of that company in particular is unimaginable. Um, so I think that it's gonna have to reach that point. Um, but you know, I, I'm not sure what, exactly what your, your question was. The, the reality on the ground is that genetic engineering um, for, of plants and the way that they're doing it is very brittle. Um, when you think about the vulnerability of a monoculture, um, what they've done with genetic engineering is to take that an octave further. This is the ultimate monoculture where every single plant is genetically identical. So particularly as climate disruption comes in, these things are super vulnerable and we're gonna see really big crashes. There's also a ton more research coming out about now about glyphosate and water pollution and all kinds of health effects from that. So, I mean, I think there's a fuse lit and you know that whole, aspect of big ag is going to crash and burn. Um, but a lot of it is really political, not biological in that sense. So I'm not sure if that's what your question was about, but. Okay, thank you. So we've got one more question before we do some stretching exercises from the lovely Jess. Um. Hi, Kenny. Um, when I uh, went looking for the most uh, sustainable, free-ranging meat I could find, it turned out not to be at the grocery store at all. It was actually raising itself in the forest and treating itself rather well comparatively. Um, and so I took up hunting of venison in America and have been sort of dumbfounded ever since that um, apparently none of, none of that meat ever makes its way to the grocery store or any restaurant or anything. The, the actual role of a professional hunter is, is outlawed in America. There's no such thing. It's just a recreational pastime. And... Um, 
in California suburbs, there's herds of deer walking through people's backyards while the meat that ends up on the table has come from a concentration camp. What's going on? Um, you know, I think it's a really great point to raise, Josh, and there are absolute pests on the east coast of the U.S. as well. I mean, and tre tremendous hazards with driving and, you know, roadkill and all that. So I think it's a really valid point that in light of the conversation this morning about, you know, pests. I mean, there's overpopulation because the predators are gone and, you know, the, the whole natural balance has been, um, you know, upended. So I think that kind of question is really valuable to raise as to why, why we aren't doing that. So I know I've got to get off the stage here. So thank you, thank you. I really, really appreciate it.